Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever been caught not listening to someone? Now, your minds are probably going back to school, right? Children do this in school. You daydream, stuff like that, and then the teacher calls on you, and you don't know what to say. Now, this could start happening in church. If I started calling on people, I can see you. Not too well, because the lights are awfully bright, but I can see some of you, and I know when you're sleeping, because your head tilts back. And sometimes people have actually made noise, full-on snoring, it's kind of funny. Wow, no, it's a real thing. <laughs> now, I want to tell you a secret. It's a pastor's secret. So you've got to be careful with it. Sometimes this happens the other way around. And most of you all don't know it. You see, I'll give you the background. Public speaking by itself can be kind of scary in the beginning. You get nervous. There's a lot of stuff to remember, right? Now, imagine handling the God of Word, the Word of God. See? <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Sometimes, like Moses, you get tongue-tied. You gotta know how to roll with it. So it's difficult, especially when you're new. In the very beginning, it's tough. And so if you've never had to speak publicly, you might have had to memorize a phone number at one time. And between the time in which you get the phone number and then you can get to like something to write on in the ancient times or your phone or tablet or something, you try to remember it. You keep it in the front of your mind. So you're doing your thing, 8675309, and then someone comes up to you and talks to you and you lose it, or if they know you're trying to memorize it because you're talking to yourself, we do this as we get older, they start throwing numbers at you, 10, 30, 53, eight, and messes you up. So it's kind of the same thing. You have something in the front of your mind, you're trying to keep it there. And then someone comes up to you and starts talking to you. Now inevitably, about 99.9% .9 of the time, they say this first. I know you're about to preach, but 10, 35, 8, 7, and they're going to give it to you, right? <laughs> I know you're about to preach, but... So, a little, little side thing. I have a pastor friend. They have a rule in their church where you're not allowed to talk to them about any ministry stuff before the sermon. I think it's a pretty good rule, but we'll modify it. If in your head... Yeah, I agree. Glad someone agrees with me this morning. <laughs> if in your head... You start thinking, I know you're about to preach, but just keep that in your head. That's it. Just keep the whole thing in your head and save it for later. We can book an appointment. We can go in my office, and then you can tell me what you think. But here's the thing. Sometimes it's about something important, and as you develop as a pastor, you, know, you need to roll with it. You need to listen because it may be important. In the beginning, don't do this to new pastors, people who don't speak, because it throws them. 
but it's usually about something like the coffee. Right? So the coffee wasn't, we ran out of caffeinated, like why is that my problem? We have like a hundred other people who can deal with this. Yeah, but that's what happens. The creamer, it's not creamy enough. The sugar, it's not sugary enough. Like, whatever. And so what happens is the person turns into Charlie Brown's teacher. I'm tuning out at this point. 867-5309, 867-5309. And so it's difficult. But then what happens sometimes is this. What do you think? What are we going to do about the coffee? Wah, 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 but I forgot what they're talking about. So I'm going to give you a pastoral trick. Like any good trick, you don't want to abuse it. You don't want to use it too much. But here it is. Wah, 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 wah. What do you think? Now, you got to watch your facial controls. There's a class in pastor school. They teach you facial control 101. And so you can't go like that. That's what's happening inside, behind my face. You have to go... Wah, 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 wah. What do you think? This is a good pastor face. Let's them know you're taking them very seriously. Some of you are going, hey. <laughs> and you gotta wait, give it a second. These things take time. It works, but like a good magic trick, you can't abuse it. You gotta know when to use it. But it works for a lot of things. Pastor, I'm trying to find someone I'm sick of being single. These things take time. <laughs> right? So you can now, you're not even going to remember anything I said in the rest of the sermon. You'll be trying this out on the way home. And you're going to find holes in it, like this morning. Tracy, she told me she found a new job. That would have not been the appropriate time to say, these things take time. She would have been like, <laughs> what? I actually listened to her. But I'm a little more experienced. So for new people... Be careful with it. Don't wear it out. Try it out on the way home. <laughs> now, it works well because it's generally true. We know this. Good things take time. Good things come to those who wait. I saw this at a deli counter. Because, you know, if you work at a deli, what? Everyone's always in a rush. We don't have delis here, so what am I talking about? Uh, whatever. A, a place where you get food. There's no good delis here. It doesn't exist. Actually, there's one across the street. I won't plug them yet because... Anyway, I'm still trying to figure it out. But the sign said, good food takes time. It's true. Good things take time. And we're going to see that this morning. It's biblical. Exodus 7, 8. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. We'll see this today. Quick recap. You can go online and watch the messages, but... Heather did a great job at basically going through 15 chapters of the Bible and getting every detail completely right. Afterwards, somebody came up to me and said, she's going to take your job. These things take time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to do the full recap. You can go watch it. This is a lot of information. We're going to be doing this again today, about 15 chapters. I don't know why we torture ourselves. I actually do, because it's going to come full circle. There's complete thought. you got to look at larger sections of the Bible to really get the point here, and that's why we're doing this. So there's a lot to fit in here. I think I can get it done and get you out of here by about 3 or 4 o'clock. <laughs> don't worry. Kara Lee's going to cook some popcorn. Just kidding about the popcorn. <clears throat> so here we arrive at the end of Genesis, and we see it seems like rap, rapid succession. Jacob dies, then Joseph dies. Right? So there's a span of time there. They're in Egypt, so they get embalmed. That's kind of interesting. I'm going to try not to digress on that for too long. It says here in the notes, keep going. So I will. <laughs> We're going to get to Exodus. Now, the promise made to Abraham is being fulfilled. They're multiplying greatly. But what is the problem? The problem is that, well, Pharaoh dies too. And they forget what Joseph did. So now they're multiplying, 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 and they're worried. What if we get into a war with someone and they side with them? It's not going to be good. They're going to get away or overrun us. There are a lot of problems happening here. Solution. We will enslave them. So they do. They make them make bricks. 
You need straw, apparently, to make the bricks. I've never made a brick before. I don't know. But it's going to be an issue, as we'll see. So they're enslaved. And this is not good for them. But if we go back, we should know this. Maybe Abraham should have told them. I don't know. They shouldn't be surprised because when we saw the initiation of the covenant to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, remember the carcasses cut in half and God goes through. Well, this is what it says, Genesis 15, 12. As the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, you can be sure that your, your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. I will punish the nation that enslaves them. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. Galatians 3, later in Exodus chapter 12, it clarifies 430 years. Sometimes dates are generalized. Get over it. Right, so let's move on. <laughs> Now, it's worth mentioning very quickly that if you know the word really well, you know there was a foreshadowing of this also. It's not just what God tells Abram at this point. He's not quite Abraham yet. What happens in his deception? So you see this kind of cycle going through the Bible where they've got to go to Egypt to get grain or there's a famine or there's something like that. It actually continues into the New Testament as well the collection for the Corinthians. So people have to go to Egypt to get stuff. There's grain shortage later in Jerusalem, we'll see. So there's this theme where people have to go to certain places to overcome the famine or get stuff. We saw that in the Joseph account, right? If you were paying attention. So this happens earlier on than a lot of people realize. It's the reason that Abram goes to Egypt and then he deceives the Pharaoh. Dude, she's my sister, remember? It was a half-truth. And if you notice, they send them away with great wealth. And so we have a little foreshadowing there that you might want to go back and read. Now, we arrive at the Moses account. And I'm going to do something for you to save some time. I'm going to spoil you this morning. I'm going to give you a lot of the names. It's quite interesting. When you read this account, they don't give us all the names right away. They unveil them slowly. And you have to go to boring genealogies, I know, to get some of the other names and the relationships people have with one another. It's kind of funny. So Pharaoh, he gets the idea of killing the babies and enter in two midwives, Pua and Shipra. Weird names. I'm probably not saying them right. Let's move on. But anyway, it says that they fear God. And so they're not killing the male babies. God rewards them for it, and they have babies of their own. But Pharaoh goes, what are you doing? And they say, well, the Hebrew women, they're vigorous. The babies come out real fast. No labor, I guess. All right. Well, he says, solution. What we're going to do now is all the male infants, we're going to throw them in the Nile River and kill them, drown them. Nice guy. So this is going on. Enters into the story a Levite couple. Amram and Jochebed, spoiling you, the names aren't right there just yet. We find out that, well, it's a nephew and an aunt. That's the couple. Gross. We'll move on. <laughs> we also, so they go three months, she's pregnant. What are we going to do? They can't hide it any longer. So they make a little basket and they cover it with pitch, waterproof it, and they put it in the Nile and they float the baby down, not to kill it, but... They want to save the baby. This is going to be Moses. We'll find this out later. They want to unveil the name. I'm moving faster than that. Often overlooked part of the story is Miriam. That's Moses' sister. Doesn't give us the name there, but it's very interesting. She's critical in this story. She kind of watches at a distance. The basket's going down the river, and she notices that Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, some versions say, and her servants, they're bathing there, and they notice the basket. So they get it. They take the baby out. They hear it crying. They feel sorry for the baby. But Miriam, his sister, is watching. Quite clever. She goes up to the princess, kind of bold, and says, do you need a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? She says, sure. So she goes and gets Jochebed, the baby's mother. She nurses him. And it actually says she gets paid to do it. Kind of interesting. Some time goes by. She gives the baby back, and the baby, Moses, is raised in Pharaoh's household. 
She names it Moses. This is the Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, because she lifted him out of the water. So these names have a meaning. Some time goes by. Now, I'll let you know how we find out some of this stuff in a minute. I'm going to jump around. Moses is now 40 years old, and he's observing some of his own people. The Egyptians are being really mean to them. And so what does he do? Well, what else would you do? Just kill them. So he decides to kill this Egyptian and bury him in the sand. He thinks he's in the clear. He looks around, it says, kills him, buries him. He thinks he's good until the next day. What happens? He sees two of his own people arguing. He tries to intercede. What are you doing? Stop. They turn to him and say, what are you going to do? Kill us like you did that Egyptian? Uh oh He's in trouble. He's worried about Pharaoh coming after him, so he takes off. Sure enough, Pharaoh is coming after him, so he was right to leave. Very interesting point if you're paying attention or if you were at Bible study. He goes to Midian, and there's definitely a connection here. If you go back to the Joseph story, he was sold to Ishmaelite or Midianite slave traders. Interesting. We'll move on. So here you have another well scene. There's another scene at a well where a bride and the groom are going to meet one another. Future bride and groom are going to meet at a well. But this one's different. It says there's a priest of Midian there who has seven daughters. But the local shepherds are giving them a hard time. So Moses intercedes here, if you're seeing a theme, chases them away, waters their flock. It should sound familiar. They go back to their dad. They tell him what happened. Rule, or Jethro, his two names. I'm skipping around here. And he says, go get him. He can come be with us. They do. Some time goes by. And we see that he marries one of his daughters, Zephora, not Sephora, Zephora, Zephora, however you want to pronounce it. He has a son, Gershom. It's because He's a stranger in a strange land. If we continue, we get to the burning bush account. Now, we know he's 80 years old here, and we got to go all the way to the New Testament to get all the details here. We go all the way to Acts. Now, it's interesting. Stephen gives a sermon. Now, some people are like, oh, it's too complicated. You went over too much stuff, Gene. It was like 15 chapters, and I can't remember all of it. Well, Stephen goes through like the whole Testament, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> That's biblical preaching. That's what he's doing here. In the midst of it, we get details that aren't always in the Old Testament. Acts 7.23, one day when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the people of Israel. So dot, 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 there's all that stuff that happens there where he gets mad and then Pharaoh's chasing him around. And when Moses heard about that, he fled the country and lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. There, his two sons were born. Forty years later, in the desert near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush. So he's about 80 years old here, and that's how we know it. So the burning bush account, a lot of important details. I'm going to pass through this pretty quickly and give you a lot of the important stuff here. It's interesting to note that this happens on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Very important as we keep going through the rest of the story. He's shepherding the flock, and you notice there's a bush. It's on fire, but it's not burning up. It's not turning to ashes. That's weird. So he goes and approaches it. The Lord notices it. He says something that should be familiar. Moses, Moses, kind of like Abraham, Abraham. Responds the same way. Here I am. Take off your sandals. This is holy ground. So he does, and he covers his face, prefiguring what he's going to do with the veil. We'll see it later in the transfiguration. He covers his face. Now, making this kind of short, important detail, God says he's heard the cries of his people. He remembers the covenant that he made with them. And now he's going to use Moses to redeem them. That's the short version of this. Now, here's the thing. Moses immediately starts complaining. Moses is going to complain a lot, right? So we're just going to kind of go over it because maybe for some of you, you're like, that's kind of annoying. Moses is complaining an awful lot. But he says, who am I to do this? They're not going to believe me. Who 
Should I tell them sent me? And this is very important because God says, I am. Tell them that I am sent you. I am who I am. Very important as we get through the rest of the story. The gospel, for example, of John, the seven I am's. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the door. I'm the way, the truth, the life, and the vine. So Jesus is referencing this. That's what he's saying. He's using the name of God to speak of himself. He says, I am. They want to kill him over it. They know what it means. I am. Before Abraham was, I am is what he's saying. They want to stone him. Very important. That's what's being referenced here. Well, God continues. <laughs> and he says, and here's the main thing here, tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that, here's the important thing a lot of people miss, they can worship me. They're not just leaving to leave. They're not going for the sake of just going. They're going so that they can worship the Lord. Very important detail. People forget. It's a three-day journey. Nice little note there, just like Isaac and Abraham when they went to worship, if you remember. Well, God tells them what will happen. And he kind of tells them what happened in the, in the foreshadowing. He says, they're going to send you away. I'm going to make them let you go. <laughs> they're going to want to get rid of you and they're going to give you great wealth when you leave. Moses says, what if they don't believe me? Another complaint. Right? So he's like, come on, Moses, let's go. So he says, all right, you're going to do these things that are going to prove to them. Because first he's got to go to the Israelites, the elders of the Hebrews. And so he says, okay, see that staff in your hand? Throw it on the ground. He does it. When it does, it turns into a snake. Moses jumps back. Whoa. Then God tells him something interesting. He says, grab the snake by the tail. Now, Moses is a shepherd. He's been in the woods a lot. <laughs> so he knows, like, that's probably not a good idea. The snake's going to bite you. But he does it. Hmm, interesting. Turns back into a staff. And he says, they'll believe you when you do that. If they don't, put your hand in your cloak. Take it out. Turns leprous, all white. Put it back in. Heals the hand. If they don't believe that, take some of the water from the Nile and throw it on the ground and it'll turn to blood. Then they'll believe you. Okay. Now Moses goes on to the next series of complaints. <sighs> I'm not a good speaker. I get tongue-tied. God's got to be like, really? And God responds that way. He says, I make people see, hear, speak. What's the problem, Moses? Interesting here. If you're reading the literal word, it says that he has uncircumcised lips. It's interesting because it'll make another account make a little bit more sense. Uncircumcised lips. So circumcision is the removal of the foreskin, so it could mean his lips are sealed. They're stuck. Also, there's a story about circumcision. Maybe his lips aren't worthy. We talk about having a circumcised heart, right? So it could mean both things. It's difficult. But anyway, very interesting. He protests again. God basically says, fine, fine. We'll get Aaron to speak. He can be your prophet. He's going to speak for you. Now note, if you're taking notes, this was not God's first choice. Aaron will cause problems. <laughs> but anyway, fine, we'll get Aaron to help you out here. Moses complaining, but then he goes to Jethro. His father-in-law gets permission. They both agree the people chasing you, well, they're probably dead by now. So go ahead. You'll be safe. Go back. Now, here's where we get some names of other people. And we got to kind of jump forward. We get the Jethro thing here. Gershom, we know, is one of his kids because he goes and leaves. He takes his family with him. But it's very interesting. His other son is there. So sometimes one son is mentioned, sometimes two. But if you're looking carefully, the other son's name is Eliezer. And if you've been paying attention, that is the name of Abraham's most trusted servant. Different guy, clearly. Eliezer. It's also probably the person that got the bride for Isaac. The name means deliver. And sure enough, Eliezer delivered the bride for Isaac, if that was him, most likely. 
Kind of cool. So God, again, reassures Moses. They go through the sequence again and again and again. But in this particular one, God says something very interesting when we're looking at the rest of the story. He says, you're going to tell Pharaoh, let my son go, my son Israel. Let my son go, my son Israel. But Pharaoh won't. So I'm going to take his son. We'll see that in a minute. That's great, great meaning. Now here, deep within the text, and we talked about this, Exodus derives its name from a Greek word, not Hebrew. That's interesting. We saw that the Bible of the early church was the Greek Old Testament. They're all speaking Greek. The New Testament's written in Greek. They're quoting it in Greek. Why would they be writing a different version? They're not. There's a Greek version here. And there's some interesting language that matches extremely well with the New Testament. And so I'm going to say a Greek word, but I've been getting a little nervous lately because my Greek teacher watches online. And we have this debate all the time. I'm saying, I just need to know how to read it. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> I just need to know how to read it and then speak American to everybody. That's it. I don't need... But anyway, apparently she wants me to speak it better. So it's kind of like, I'm going to read a little Greek here, prototokos. She's watching. I almost brought my phone up here so I'd get a text. So we'd see. <laughs> so firstborn. It's really important. It's what the, the sacrifice, the worthy sacrifice of Abel was called. Same word. It's used here, my firstborn son, and it's used to describe Jesus as well. Colossians chapter 1, firstborn. Very important word, very deep scripture. So now we got to kind of move along. There's a circumcision story. It's very hard to understand and explain. They're traveling with the family. There's a point at which we just don't really know. God wants to kill Moses all of a sudden. Difficult. Then his wife, Sephora, she intercedes and circumcises. They don't say which son, probably Gershom, the older son. And then God relents. He doesn't kill Moses. She says, you're a bridegroom of blood to Moses. You can speculate a bit, but probably Moses should have known that he should have circumcised the children. Could be that. Moving on, the Lord, he tells Aaron, go see your brother Moses. Moses fills him in and they arrive in Egypt. They do the proofs, right? Throwing the snake down and stuff. They believe them. They're all excited and happy about it. Then they visit Pharaoh. Pharaoh does not take the news so well. He's like, who is this God of yours? Whatever. And what he does is he makes the slaves work harder. Now, I'm not going to give you straw. You're going to have to scrounge for that on your own. And I want twice the amount of bricks made. <laughs> the foreman, he gets beat. They don't like it anymore. And they turn on Moses and Aaron. They're like, forget it. I don't want to listen to you any longer. Okay, they blame Moses. Now, in between the plagues, we'll get to in a minute, that a lot of you kind of know about, we have chapter 6, which is really important. There's a genealogy in there, and that's where I got a lot of this information from. We see that Moses complains, even though God <laughs> reaffirms the covenant again. So this kind of thing happens over and over again in cycles. God reaffirming the covenant, Moses complaining about it over and over and over again. Also, Exodus can kind of get long here because not only are all the things that are going to happen reaffirmed, the things that happen are reaffirmed again. So he tells kind of the basics of the story there, and then they move along. So we'll move along. Now we get to my favorite part. Here we have what I like to call a magic battle. It's kind of cool. And it's interesting to note, <clears throat> they go before Pharaoh, they're going to start doing these different things. And again, this is going to be the cycle. Let my people go so that they can worship me. And then Pharaoh's heart is hardened. But first, it's Aaron who presents the staff, does a snake thing. It's not Moses. Kind of interesting. Here we have magicians. Pharaoh has magicians in his court. And they're doing tricks. They replicate that trick. But 
Aaron's snake eats theirs. Does that remind you of Joseph's visions a little bit? Kind of interesting. Eats theirs. Here's another interesting thing. The magicians have names. Very few people know where to find them. They're actually not. They're not in the Old Testament at all. So it's an example, as I've said before, where the New Testament provides us with the best commentary on the Old Testament. They're in an interesting place. They're kind of said in passing by Paul to Timothy. Now, a lot of you know the verses before it. You may have even quoted them. It's about false teachers in 2 Timothy. All right, so there's going to come a time when there's going to be false teachers. But Paul is saying it's nothing new. Continues about the false teachers, 2 Timothy 3, 8. These teachers oppose the truth just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Jonas and Jambres. Those are the names of the court magicians. Here we're going to get to a part of the presentation that's not my favorite. Heather and I have been having debates about charts. She's more of a school teacher, and so she sees the value in visual presentation. And I like it too. So I'm going to appease her now, and we're going to use a chart with the blanks. <laughs> right, so marriage advice, really quick. You can be right, or you can be happy. So I'm going to be happy. Aren't the charts wonderful? And these are kind of fun, but I don't want you to be distracted by the dying bull with his tongue hanging out or the boil hands. It's kind of gross, but I don't know, whatever. This is one of the more entertaining ones that I could find. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because this is pretty long, this account. Just know that there are cycles. Let my people go so they can worship me. That's the stated reason. Don't ever forget that. But Pharaoh's heart is hard. So it begins with the Nile turning to blood. Aaron does it with the staff, strikes the water. It's in the presence of Pharaoh and the magicians. The Nile turns to blood. Note, this is a reversal. They threw the babies into the Nile to kill them. Really? You want to put blood in the water? Here you go. Here's blood in the water. Note, all the water, even in the pots and jars, all turns to blood. There's no good water anywhere. And so they're digging for water. They can't find it. Seven days goes by. Pharaoh does not relent. Okay, raise the staff again, Aaron, and we're going to have a plague of frogs. This kind of sounds funny, and even the text is a little bit funny because it says they're jumping everywhere, jumping everywhere. They're jumping into the bed. They're jumping into the kitchen and to the pots and stuff like that. But you got to think about it, especially here in Southwest Florida. You don't get used to the frogs. When I moved here, I asked the bug guy, like, what can we do about these lizards? Can you kill them? And I didn't understand the ecosystem and all these important things. You're not allowed to kill the lizards. They take care of the mosquitoes. Anyway, I don't care. They're gross, but I got used to them. The frogs? They're disgusting, right? They're gross, man. Like, especially at nighttime, they come out and they jump on you. You ever get a frog jump on your foot or something like that? That's disgusting. So now imagine, like, everything is covered with frog. Everything. Everything. Right? So it's really bad. And Pharaoh's heart is still hardened. And now we're going to enter a cycle. I'm just doing this quickly. Where... <laughs> Pharaoh is going to begin asking Moses to pray for him. So make this go away. Moses prays. It goes away. Pharaoh's heart is hardened again as soon as it goes away. Well, why? Well, we see that up to a certain point, the magicians are replicating it. So you might be thinking, no big deal. You're just a couple of magicians. Also, if we jump ahead a little bit, we get some good reasoning. I just grabbed this scripture because I felt it described it really well. Exodus 10.1. Then the Lord said to Moses, return to Pharaoh, this is in the middle cycle here, and make, or towards the end, make your demands again. I have made him and his officials stubborn so I can display my miraculous signs among them. I've also done it so you can tell your children and grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and about the signs I displayed among them so that you will know that I am the Lord. It is all so that God gets the glory, period, end of story. Or maybe Pharaoh was in denial. Had to do it. 
We'll, we'll get into it a little bit more Bible study. We get some more good New Testament commentary on Romans chapter 9, but we will be running out of time. So back to the magic battle. We saw the frogs. Then Aaron strikes the ground. We have the plague of the gnats and the lice. Gross. Here's where Jonas and Jombers give up. They can't replicate certain things at the gnats or lice. Exodus 8.18, Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same thing with their secret arts, but this time they failed, and the gnats covered everyone, people and animals alike. This is the finger of God, the magicians exclaimed to Pharaoh, but Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He wouldn't listen to them, just as the Lord had predicted. So, God tells them again, let my people go so that they can worship me. And here we see a shift. Now the Lord starts doing things. We don't need the staff anymore, any of that stuff. So I see flies, flies covering everything. And this is serious too. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Heather probably knows. You can ask her later. Uh, back in the day, they'd have flies everywhere in the medieval times, and people would go nuts because the flies on them. They'd like just go totally crazy during that time. Actually, it's said that many scribal errors in some old texts, including biblical texts, were made because of this. It would be so distracting. So imagine them absolutely everywhere. Gross. But here's what's interesting. Not going to send them on the people of Goshen. Remember, that's where the, the Hebrews or Israelites settled in Goshen. They're not going to get hit with the flies. You are. So now the cycle continues. I'm going to overview pretty quickly. We have the plague with the livestock, again, not in Goshen. There's something very interesting. Moses begins to operate now. He picks up some dust. But if you've got a pretty good version, it's going to make a note that it's kiln soot, furnace soot. He throws it up in the air, and people get hit with the boils. This is like vengeance for making the slaves make the bricks. Turns that around. So it continues. Lightning bolts. We see the locusts. Finally, darkness. They can't even see one another, except the people where the, where the Hebrews live. They can see one another. Now you get something very, very important. God's warning about the killing of the firstborn. So remember, you detained or kept my sons. You killed my son. I'm going to kill yours. And so there's a pretty lengthy account. What happens with this whole Exodus Passover account is it gets long because God says all the details and then Moses reiterates it. So it gets a little bit complicated. I'm going to shorten it for you. We only have so much time on Sunday morning. It was really a joke about the three o'clock thing. So <laughs> to make it short for you, this is the initiation. So what God is going to do is kill all the firstborn sons, firstborn animals too, and he killed them. But he's going to provide protection beyond just being in Goshen for the Israelites. He's going to initiate a festival, a very important one that they will celebrate every year to remember this. That's the point of it. And it's going to provide protection for them. They are to kill one-year-old male lamb. They're to cook it a certain way, bitter herbs and spices. They're going to roast it. They're going to eat it, all of it, before morning. Also, you're going to get all the leaven out of your house, the yeast, all of it out of your house. Also, when you eat it, you're going to eat it with your sandals on and with your staff in hand. You know, everything, this is getting weird. Why? Well, because it speaks of the speed at which they're going to have to get out of there. So, for example, you know, Lucille's like, I want to bake some bread. I said, well, we got somewhere to go. Hurry up. Well, don't put the yeast in it, right? Because that's going to take time to wait for it to rise. Just cook it. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Speed. Put your shoes on. Get ready. And then we'll eat quick. Get out of here. This is the idea that's going on. Now, very important. You're not going to eat the blood. We know about this from earlier on. Don't eat the blood of the animal. Instead, you're going to use that. You're going to take a hyssop branch and you're going to paint basically your door frame. Of the houses that have this blood that are covered by the blood of the lamb, the death angel of the Lord or the Lord will pass over those houses. And those firstborn children will not 
die. He's going to say later, you'll have to redeem them, but they won't die. Okay. Then the exodus occurs, but understanding this is critical to understanding Christianity, to understanding the gospel, to understanding who Jesus really is and what he did for us. It's very, very important. He died to cover us in his blood, to redeem us from our slavery to sin, and so that God will pass over us in final judgment if we are covered in Christ's blood. Now, there's some more New Testament commentary that people don't pick up on, which clarifies some things. And hopefully by learning this story, this will make a little more sense to you, like Jonathan Jambres. So here in context, we have the church in Corinth, and they're experiencing all kinds of difficulties. Before we point fingers, so are we. They're going through all these different things. Finally, there's this instance where a man is sleeping with his stepmother. It's weird. I've told you why it can happen. You can ask me again at Bible study. But what happens is they're not doing anything about it. It's going on. And Paul steps in to say, ah, kick him out of the church. This is really bad. He's not doing anything about it. You're not doing anything about it. But the point is, you're prideful. You're boasting about this. Shouldn't you know that, as we would say today, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch? Setting yourself up for failure. So he says this, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, you're boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. It could puff you up. But now when you have the Passover account in your head, it should make more sense. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Jesus is our bread of life. He is the Passover lamb. Just as Pharaoh's firstborn son died, now God, to redeem us, gives us his firstborn son. If we go back to the Exodus account, we see another Passover, which people don't often connect to the most obvious one. So indeed, there's a great Exodus, and it cannot be stated enough. Probably 600,000 males, many say about two and a half million people total are leaving the land. Pharaoh doesn't want to deal with them anymore. He's like, get out of here. This is enough. In fact, the people give them all their goods and stuff like that, so they go away wealthy, like Abraham did, if you remember. Well, they're taken care of for a while. They're going to wander a bit. God makes the path confusing so they don't change their mind and go back. But when they see Pharaoh coming after him, because what does he do? Changes his mind again. They start panicking. They get really worried. Moses says, the Lord will fight for us. And so most of us know the story. Moses raises his hand or staff, parts the sea, and they pass over the dry ground. Then Pharaoh and the arrogant Egyptians, hot pursuit, closes them in, baptizes them, so to speak, in death. Significant as you killed my sons in the water, in the Nile. Now you will die. Not the Nile, but the Red Sea. Interesting. Many also don't pick up on Jesus' exodus from the world. So depending on what account you're reading, Luke or Mark, in Mark, this is where Peter's going to get rebuked. Jesus talks about his suffering for the first time in chapter 8. Peter's like, no, 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 just get behind me, Satan. What does it profit someone to gain the whole world but lose their life or soul? If we continue reading, Luke in particular says this, both into chapter 9, about 
Eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Hold on to that as we continue later on in the rest of the story. Suddenly, two men, significant, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Jesus' death on the cross leads to our future exodus as well. During the crucifixion, just as darkness fell over the land before the death of the firstborn sons, the ninth plague, darkness, before they die, so too darkness fell over the land when God's firstborn son died. If you read the account, you have to read all four Gospels to get it all. I'll put it together for you. John notes that they took, he's dying on the cross, a hyssop branch and dipped it in the blood of the grape in sour wine and offered it to him. Then darkness falls over the land. Luke 23, 44, by this time it was about noon. And darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. That is the ninth hour. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what happened, he worshiped. He praised God and said, surely this man was innocent. Mark's account adds, Surely this was the Son of God. It's a Roman soldier who worships. We are covered in Jesus' blood now and have an expectation of an exodus from this world and the grave. As they passed over on dry ground across the sea, by way of Jesus, we pass over the ground and the grave. We are safe from final judgment. Exodus is a foreshadowing of what is to come when Jesus comes back, because he's coming again. He, or Moses that is, was a foreshadowing of what was to come in Christ and what still is to come in Christ. We get to Revelation and we see that much of Exodus is a foreshadowing. We see plagues. And Jesus comes back. We see punishment on those who persecuted God's children. Then we see this, Revelation 19, 11. Then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood. And his title was the Word of God. He sorts it all out, not us. Moses, Exodus 14, when they're freaking out about being pursued, he assures them. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay come. We too have assurance that the Lord will fight for us. So we must stay calm. Did you know that patience is a fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. We need to be patient because these things take time. Sometimes 430 years. In the instant gratification of Jonas and Jambres or the false teachers of this world, there's deception. But God tells us to be patient because he too is patient. Peter, we see there's terrible suffering. We think things are crazy now, but we're not being burned alive. They were. 
And they're wondering, why isn't he coming back now? Peter says this, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want any, everyone to be destroyed or anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. God is patient with us, and so we must be patient, regardless of the circumstance or how bad we think things are in this crazy world. We must stay reassured that Jesus is coming back and that the Lord will fight for us. Amen? Amen. Amen.